Hare Krishna. So today we continue our discussion on the Bhagavad Gita. We'll be discussing the seventh chapter, 24th text. And the topic we'll be discussing is, is the ultimate reality personal or impersonal? So quick overview of what we have discussed in the previous sessions. In the last session we discussed about different gods. The overall from the seventh chapter, the idea is that we are discussing how God manifests in the world. And now continuing that thread of discussion, discussing that when we start from the world and then try to conceive God, how we arrive at particular conceptions and how those conceptions may not be the uh, fullest or the most complete conceptions. So this is 724 in the Gita. So Krishna is speaking here. Avyaktam vyaktim apannam. Avyaktam is unmanifest. Vyaktim apannam is to become manifest. So those who think that I was unmanifest before and now I have become manifest. Manyante maam abuddhayaha. Such people are lacking in intelligence. Param bhava majananto. They do not understand my ultimate transcendental nature. Mama vyayam anuttamam. I am imperishable and I am avyaya is imperishable. Anuttamam is transcendental. Tama is darkness. I am transcendental. I am supreme. So I exist beyond matter and material conceptions. So let's, uh, uh, based on this verse, let's have our discussion today. So I'll be talking about three broad points. So first is the inconceivable multi-level nature of the ultimate reality. Second is that within this multi-level conception, the, where the impersonal conception is right and where it goes wrong. And then we'll look at the transperceptional personal conception that is Krishna. So the inconceivable multi-level nature of the ultimate reality. So here, when we talk about inconceivability, we can start with even our day-to-day -day experiences wherein we notice that actually uh, ordinary objects, as we start studying them deeper and deeper, they become more and more complex. Even in science, material reality, if we look at it deeper and deeper, quantum physics is so complicated. A uh, prominent quantum physicist said that if you think you have understood quantum physics, then you haven't understood it. The universe is not only stranger than what we imagine, it is stranger than what we can imagine. So quantum physics has a chimera of particles which, which make no sense to our normal way of looking at things. And yet quantum physics in its own way works. The math is remarkably powerful. So the point uh, I'm making here is that things as we go deeper into them, they become more and more com complex. So even if for that matter, if you consider physical reality, physical reality itself is complex, although much of it is, at least some of it is perceivable to us by our senses. But not to speak of ultimate reality, which is not actually perceivable to our senses. So one of the defining attributes of the ultimate reality is said to be that it is achintya. Achintya means inconceivable. So Jiva Goswami is a prominent um, uh, Vaishnava Acharya uh, from the 16th century. And he writes that the achintyatva, the inconceivability of the absolute truth means that the Supreme is superior to our intelligence by definition. If, our in, if by our intelligence we could understand the Supreme completely, then it would be our intelligence would become Supreme. So by definition, the entire Supreme is superior to the intelligence. And that means we cannot comprehend the Absolute by intellectual analysis and intellectual conquest. So the ultimate reality has to be approached with humility. Why are we discussing this point in the light of our discussion today? 
that is the ultimate reality personal or impersonal no the understanding the nature of ultimate reality itself is complex is not easy so some people say that the ultimate reality is personal some people say it's impersonal and this discussion has been going this discussion and debate has been going on for a millennia now but so what is right so here niels bohr talks and makes a very interesting statement that the opposite of a correct statement is a false statement but the opposite of a profound truth may well be another profound truth so our simple polarity of true and false that applies with respect to say ordinary dealings in math 3 plus 7 is 10 that's true 3 plus 7 is 11 is false so that's in ordinary dealings but when you go to profound truths the opposite of a profound truth may may not be a falsity but it may be a, another profound truth so god is the ultimate reality is personal the ultimate reality is impersonal both of these are profound truths to say that one is right and the other is wrong is a is a oversimplification to the point of distortion there is truth there is reality when a profound level of reality to both aspects that's why we approach this controversy with humility we don't simply say that my understanding is right and yours is wrong so it might be that if we are personalists we consider the impersonal understanding wrong or the impersonalists may consider personal understanding wrong but rather what we understand is that our understanding is light lie at various positions on a spectrum of rightness and wrongness and we need to uh, uh, carefully and humbly understand things as they are so the first point i made is that this ultimate reality is multi level and inconceivable so now let's look at now when we say thing is inconceivable does it mean it can't be understood yes it can't be understood exhaustively completely still we can get some understanding so now let's look at where the impersonal understanding is right and where it goes wrong so first point is that what do we now at one level intuitively we do we have probably read about saints or heard from our elders people praying to god and when they pray they treat god like a person there have been great saints who have said that they communed with god they saw god and many of them have talked of god as a person so the personal understanding at one level is widespread but at another level there is an impersonal understanding so why might some why might somebody think that the ultimate reality is impersonal and what could be right or wrong about their understanding so it's not that their understanding is right or wrong but there there are things about their understanding which are right and there are things which are not so right so at the very first level uh, one reason why people think that the ultimate reality cannot have a form and cannot be a person is that the understanding is that the ultimate reality which is often referred to as god is unlimited and normally when we can encounter anyone with form or person or personhood then they attempt that they are limited say if somebody has a form say if i am situated here right now in india near mumbai then i am not in america if say you are in new york then you are not in new zealand so we if we when we have a form that limits us and personhood also means there is limitation in the sense that different people have different qualities and some people don't so everybody has some strengths and some weaknesses uh, so form also is temporary limited in the sense that it is limited in time our bo- even the most attractive looking forms after some t- some years or some decades they lose their attractiveness so if god is unlimited not limited by space or time then how could god be a person so that understanding that is one reason why people think that god cannot have a form god must be something which is not personal now yeah we could say that form limits something 
but then we could just turn the argument around and does formless formlessness make a thing unlimited suppose a person is living in a house maybe it's a apartment or maybe it's a mansion whatever it is it is finite it has a form and it is finite suppose somebody detonates a powerful bomb and demolishes the whole home then what remains the form will be removed what we will have just a heap of debris now is that debris unlimited no it is also limited so just the remove okay form causes limitation but the removal of form does not remove limitation so what happens over here is actually if we say that the unlimited that the absolute truth the ultimate reality has to be unlimited and therefore the ultimate reality should be formless but formlessness does not automatically equate with unlimitedness on the other hand if we use say if we use the word formless implicit in that is the word less and that means the ultimate reality is less than something is deficient is devoid of form and form is one of the most attractive realities in this world whether it is people or whether it is some products so we look at the forms and we are attracted that's one thing that attracts us quite a bit so if that is one of the most attractive things in the world and the ultimate reality is the source of the world then to say that the ultimate reality lacks something which is present in the uh, in the things which that ultimate reality has sourced is a deficient understanding so form so in one sense saying that god is formless also limits god because it strips god of the of the one of the most attractive things in the world now that's one point another point we could say is where uh, where the impersonal conception is right is some people say that you know why should god have a if god at all has a form then why should his form be like ours they call it as anthropomorphism so anthropo is uh, human morphize form so anthropomorphism is to ascribe a human like form to the divine so some people argue that Now, if there were a community of uh, elephants, and they were going to worship someone, they would make the biggest elephant as their god. If there were a community of eagles, they might make they might conceive of God as an eagle. So we are humans, and therefore we have conceived of God as a human being. So the very fact that we have attributed a human-like form to God. that indicate that this is a product of our imagination yes the question could be that if if we had if we had attributed or ascribed a human like form to god then it is it is a it is a complication it is a problem but is that really the reality that when god is 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 describe god is worshiped in a particular way when the ultimate reality is conceived in a particular form what is the nature of that form how do we know for sure that it is a product of our imagination so this is a valid concern in that sense it's right if it were simply anthropomorphic then it could be a problem but the the challenge with psychologizing is that it it's a double edged sword the same thing can be turned around so there is what we could call as theomorphism rather than saying that god's form is anthropomorphic we could also say that our form is theomorphic theomorphic means our form is modeled on god's form not that his form is modeled on ours the two are significantly if not uh, radically opposite and now we may say okay if there are so many forms why should god's form why should our form be modeled on god's form is that is because the the present form that we have is the form that can take us closest to god among all the forms that are in nature 
here form we refer to species here we refer to bodily forms the soul is evolving through various species in material existence and the soul's consciousness is most evolved in the human form the soul's consciousness is closest to perceiving and then pursuing the ultimate reality when the soul is in a human form so the human form is best suited for realizing the divine and for realizing the divine form so this, that's why because the human form is is rich with spiritual potential is pregnant with the with transcendental inclination that's why this human form or the form in nature which is pregnant with such transcendental potential that form god has arranged to be modeled on his own form so it's not that we have given god a particular form but that god has given those souls who are the closest to attaining him a particular form and that is a form modeled on his so the, it's not it's not that a god is anthropomorphic rather god is anthropomorphized rather our form is theomorphic now now here we we'll go forward and look at earlier i talked about okay if we say god does have a form but then wouldn't that limit god uh, not necessarily just like we discussed earlier that okay form causes limitedness but then formlessness doesn't remove limitedness so what causes limitation is not form but matter matter with or without form is limited so that is depicted here in the form of a, a graph x y axis so on the y axis the negative axis is, is matter or material and the positive axis is spirit spiritual so material form being on the negative axis is by nature limited anything made of matter is finite and limited finite in time and limited in space the spiritual form on the other hand it may seem limited but it has the potential to be unlimited many of the past times of krishna who is revealed in the bhagavad gita to be the ultimate reality the in the past times of krishna he is finite but suddenly with finite form he does things which are not possible for any finite form to do so the most a classic example would be krishna opening his mouth and showing mother yashoda the whole universe within his mouth and uh, so this happened when krishna was a small child and he was doing his pastimes and his friends alleged that he has eaten mud and mother yashoda said have you eaten he said no but the why are they telling no they are just making they want to make fun of me they are lying really okay then open your mouth so when he opened his mouth then she saw not just the maybe the the tongue and the tooth with various cavities and root canals and dentures or whatever she saw the whole universe she saw the the sky the planets the earth the oceans and she saw even vrindavan and herself within krishna now somebody might say oh this is just a story this is just a mythology no if we want to understand the conception of god as is revealed in the absolute truth now we cannot imp simply impose our own interpretations on on scripture so we need to see what scripture is actually saying so the bhagavat puran madhav shrimad bhagavatam repeatedly declares that krishna is supreme and then depicts krishna's past times and in those past times the one such past time depicts how although he is in a limited form but he is not limited by that form so see god god's unlimitedness is is quite extraordinary see he is unlimited but he is not stuck with his unlimitedness just like say some people are very tall now if they are going they, they may be so tall that if they have to go through a door then they have to bend down otherwise they they hit their head and 
there are times when being tall is an advantage but there are times when being tall is a disadvantage but they are stuck with their tallness see god is not like that god is unlimited but he is not stuck with his unlimitedness so for the purpose of his pastimes for the purpose of reciprocating love with his devotees and having loving exchanges with them he manifests in a personal form and that form is, it seems limited to us so you know, if god manifests in an unlimited form it would be very difficult to have a personal relationship you know, if we want to have a personal relationship with the sky say sky is everywhere you know how do how do we hug the sky how do what do we do for the sky so god is unlimited but he's not stuck with his unlimitedness he he can manifest in a limited seeming form but he is not limited by that form he is unlimited even while being in a limited form so so how is that possible because his form is spiritual so spirit has that potential to be unlimited even while seeming limited so, so this is where god's nature when at earlier talked about inconceivable now how can something be having a form and be unlimited well that is something which is not so easy for us to conceive that's why the first point i mentioned was the inconceivable nature of the ultimate reality and then if we move forward let's look at what is this idea of the spiritual form so we have let's look at what scripture teaches here so some, sometimes those who are impersonalists may quote uh, that nirgun nirakar brahma without any qualities without any form that's the nature of the brahma the ultimate reality but the ultimate reality has no form but then the same scripture ha- contains many descriptions of the divine form there are great devotees and saints who have adored the lord glorified the lord by describing him in vivid verses and there this form is described his form is adored and worshiped so both are present over there there is the description of the ultimate reality as having no form and the ultimate reality as having form so if both are there then what does it mean so uh, to understand this we need to understand a, a scriptural hermeneutical principle called arthapatti so hermeneutical principle means hermeneutics is the art of understanding or interpreting a uh, text especially a scriptural text and there are various strategies by which something which doesn't seem understandable can become understandable so one such strategy is arthapatti say let's consider one traditional example of arthapatti say there is a young man named devdat so devdat doesn't eat any food throughout the day that's one statement now other statement is devdat's weight is increasing you say hey that doesn't make sense if somebody is not eating shouldn't their weight be decreasing so there are two statements if if we know that both of them are assertions that are and assertions and both of them seem true then how do we reconcile either we say one is false and the other is true but if both are true then to reconcile them we have to we have to postulate a third statement which reconciles the two so what could be the third statement that the arthapatti the postulation to resolve contradiction would be devdatt eats secretly at night eats secretly at night so the idea is throughout the day it isn't eat but it is at night so similarly scripture does contain one statement the ultimate reality has no form other statements there are many other statements which say that ultimate reality has form so what is the arthapatti the postulation here is that the ultimate reality has no material form but has spiritual form so the statements about formlessness refer to Uh, no material form and the statements about form refer to a non material or spiritual form and that's so as far as the negative axis is concerned yes there's nothing on the negative axis but there is a lot of reality on the positive axis so that's why the word we could use here is transpersonal because often when the word impersonal is used 
then it is it is as if the word says conveys is less than a person and if simply the word personal is used it might convey that god is a person just like us but transpersonal means that he is a transcendental person so trans is more than a person that it is it's not so he's impersonal doesn't mean he's lacking personality and personal doesn't simply mean that he is having a personality like ours the ultimate reality is transpersonal and that is the holistic understanding that the ultimate reality is is both is both personal and non personal person in the sense of having on the positive axis and non personal in the or impersonal in the sense that is not a person like us so let's explore this understanding further uh, in the shrimad bhagavatam 8th canto there is a again jiva goswami talks about this in the sandarbhas that he gives this as a classic example to understand this transcendental personality of the divine so the 8th canto talks about this is 839 this is gajendra is praying to the ultimate reality please come and save me and while praying what he refers to the ultimate reality apparently by seemingly first a impersonal idea a rupaya rupa is form a rupaya is no form uru rupaya having uru is many uru rupaya is many forms so that reality that ultimate reality that divine who has no form and who has many forms now how is it possible namaha i offer my prostrated obeisances to that person aashcharya karmane whose deeds are astounding karma karma is karma uh, karma is actions aashcharya is astounding so that ultimate reality is capable of astounding deeds so this is an example here of where arthapatti would be required in the same verse arupaya and ururupaya both are talked about no form and many forms so how is this to be reconciled that actually the ultimate reality has a form that is non material and that there is a non material form that is aschary karma that is astonishing so now let's move let's move deep more deeper to the transpersonal conception so the way we have been discussing is first understand the ultimate reality is impersonal is inconceivable then we talked about the rightness and the wrongness within the impersonal conception and concluded with the transpersonal understanding so now let's so it's like we are moving closer and closer now let's look at the transpersonal conception more uh, at a with greater proximity so this is again bhagavatam 1 to 11 and this is a classic verse for understanding the absolute truth vadanti tat tattvavidas tattvam yad gyanam advayam brahmeti paramatmeti bhagwan iti shabdyate so here it is said that vadanti is known or is spoken about tat tattvavidas tattvavidas is those who know the tattva is truth vidas is those who know so those who know the truth speak thus about that truth about that tattva what is that tattva gyanam advayam is non dual knowledge it is it is one reality and that reality is known as brahmeti paramatmeti bhagwan iti shabdyate is known as brahma is known as paramatma is known as bhagwan iti shabdyate is known in different ways thus so there is one ultimate reality and there are different perceptions so three levels of perceptions brahman paramatma and bhagwan now let's look at these three perceptions and let's start with a metaphor here if we consider a cake now a cake has pertinent to our uh, discussion three attributes there's fragrance there's shape and there's taste so just like the ultimate reality has sat chit and ananda the ultimate sat is eternal so existence ultimately eh, there is there is so much changing reality but there is some reality underlying it which is unending which is unchanging which is which is eternally existent that is sat and then chit is that it is it is cognizant it is it is permeated it is made of consciousness 
and then it is blissful ananda so satchit ananda at one level these are all attributes that we long for now we all long to live forever we long want we all want to know more and more what is this what is that we, what we want to know may vary based on our particular interests but we all want to know and we all want to be happy so we want to exist we want to know and we want to enjoy so these three innate attributes that we all have these are present and the full these are also the inherent attributes of the ultimate reality that's what the uh, what the uh, scriptures tell us so now with this background let's look at these three conceptions of the absolute so if we consider a cake now say i am in this room and the next to me is the kitchen and then i start getting some fragrance hey what is that so the from afar the first experience of the cake that i have is its fragrance then then i get intrigued by it and i go there so i go out of the room and go to the next room and then i see from far hey that's a cake so i look at the form so first i see the fragrance then i from far i can feel the fragrance then i can uh, go closer then i sense the form in this case sense the shape in this case oh it, it's a cake and then i move forward and then i ask whether i can have a piece and they say yes and then i take a piece when i eat it then that is the fullest experience of the cake so the cake itself is one object but sometimes the cake is perceived in terms of its fragrance sometimes in terms of its shape so fragrance and shape and then sometimes in terms of fragrance shape and taste so even when i am experiencing only the fragrance of the cake the cake remains the same object it is i am having a partial perception so similarly with respect to the ultimate reality when the ultimate reality is perceived from far then it is perceived primarily as an eternal existence so thoughtful people across the world when they start exploring the spiritual reality the first understanding they come to is not an understanding that is of the ultimate which is permeated with personality it is basically there is something which exists beyond this temporary existence so from far one perceives first thing the eternal aspect of the absolute and when the eternal aspect of the absolute is pursued so in now in this case whether a cake uh, when a cake has a fragrance when we perceive the fragrance of the cake at that time we we it's still a cake but now in the case of the ultimate reality when only one aspect of the ultimate reality is pursued say that its eternal aspect is pursued then it is still the ultimate same ultimate reality but it is referred to by a particular name there is a term for the absolute truth pursued in terms of eternal existence and that term is brahman or brahma jyoti so in this particular analytical framework brahma jyoti or brahman is the is the term used to refer to the ultimate reality perceived as eternal then if we go closer to the ultimate reality we start perceiving hey there is not just a there is not just a eternal existence that eternal existence is is also sourcing this existence and is also overseeing this existence now one of the ways in which people perceive the existence of god uh, or deduce or infer the existence of god is by looking at the order and the design in the world and there has to be some designing principle so the so that th that means that ultimate reality is not just existing but is conscious of this world and is overseeing this world so that is like perceiving not just the fragrance of the cake but also going closer and perceiving its taste sorry perceiving its uh, its shape so like that we perceive that the ultimate reality is not just existence but there is awareness awareness of this world so that the, the world can be overseen and supervised so the bhagavad gita for example says the ultimate reality is upadrashta anumanta which oversees and permits now when we go further close up 
and then we just like we go closer to the cake and then we taste the cake so like that we go even closer to the ultimate reality then we understand that the ultimate reality is not just a uh, you know, just like a neutral judge or neutral uh, law enforcer but the ultimate reality is a person who who is who sensual to experiences emotions and joy who is joyful and who and who is joy giving so that is when the anand aspect is perceived so that that the so just like we may know the say the chief of police or the chief of army as a person who enforces law and who is very strict and uh, and uh, <clears throat> authoritative but if we come to know about the personal life of that um, that military head and they have their family and there they 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 reciprocate loving relationships and they have joy so like that they there is joy there in so similarly when we go closer and closer to the ultimate reality we perceive that the ultimate reality also has um, has anand aspect and the anand comes by prema by the reciprocation of love so then this particular aspect of the absolute truth wherein we understand that the absolute truth performs loving past times that is called as bhagwan the aspect when we see the absolute truth as overseeing the world that aspect is called as parmatma so here the point we are making is the brahman is the impersonal or depersonalized conception of the absolute where there is just existence eternal and bhagwan is the personal understanding where there is the rich reciprocation of love leading to joy anand the paramatma is more of a neutral understanding it's at the intersection at the at the inter, in, intervention point a transition point between the pers, impersonal and the personal why the transition point generally when a person is in office they don't really exhibit a lot of emotions they are focused on getting the job done and okay this is the this is the rule this is the program by which the job has to be done the schedule that has to be met the target has to be met so then they do it like that so the when god is in uh, in office overseeing the world the idea of a personal relationship with him is not prominent so in that sense the paramatma aspect is said to be in in midway between the personal and the impersonal so now this might this this point might seem a little complicated so what are i'll try to repeat this i'll try to clarify this but if this doesn't become clear don't worry about it too much it's not a vital thing to understand see on one side here the ultimate reality and the ultimate reality has mm, is referred to by many names so the ultimate reality can be referred to brahman parmatma bhagwan jagdish ishwara so in a generic sense all these names refer to the refer to the absolute truth mm -hmm. now beyond the generic sense there is a specific or technical sense in which certain names are used for certain attributes of the absolute so for example the word brahman in a generic sense can be used to refer to the ultimate reality now when it is being referred to the ultimate reality this generic use is the word brahman then that is not necessarily referring to one particular aspect of the absolute this is generic usage now there is technical usage just like words words can have many meaning say for for example uh i may say what if i ask you what's up and you say the sky is up i say what's what's wrong with you you know when when i am using the word what's up where the up means you know, what's news what's what's happening new and you are using the word up in the sense of what is geographically up so the word up has two different meanings so the in the context we need to understand what is the meaning of a particular word so in a technical sense when we are looking at the analysis of the absolute truth in its three levels 
so then brahman parmatma and bhagwan refer to particular aspects of the absolute truth or the absolute truth realized with its particular as aspects so brahman parmatma and bhagwan all three can be generic reference to the again generic names of the absolute truth and brahman is sachitananda parmatma is sachitananda bhagwan is also sachitananda it's not that brahman is only sat we are talking not about the cake is always the full cake it is only that a person from a distance perceives only the fragrance it is not that the cake at that time only has fragrance and no shape or taste so there is one absolute truth is called brahman parmatma bhagwan and many other names also however because different people pursue the absolute truth differently so their particular realization of the absolute truth is also given a name so within the gaudiya vaishnava tradition uh, there is a nomenclature that is used and that nomenclature is when somebody has pursued the absolute truth in the impersonal aspect only just perceiving that there is a eternal existence then that level of realization is called as brahman there are other places in scripture where the word brahman can be used even to refer to the ultimate reality in gajendra's prayers also he refers to brahma to refer to brahma to refer to vishnu in the madhava vaishnava tradition there is a book written the title of the book is brahman is vishnu so brahman doesn't necessarily always when it is used in scripture refer to the impersonal aspect sometimes the word brahman is a generic referent and it can be used refer to the personal aspect also but within the technical analysis that is done to understand the different levels of the absolute so there is a particular nomenclature that is used so within this nomenclature brahman is the name used for the ultimate reality which is only pursued as being eternal parmatma is the name used for the ultimate reality which is pursued as eternal and cognizant and bhagwan is the term used for the ultimate reality which is eternal cognizant and blissful having said this sometimes krishna may be referred to as paramatma why because these names when they are not used in a technical context they are generic reference to the absolute truth in its com completeness mm -hmm. so now another way to understand this point is that when the ultimate reality is perceived as mere existence then there are no material potencies and there are no spiritual potencies what do we mean by material and spiritual potencies so this is again jiva goswami analysis in sandarbhas that when there is simply existence and this world is like a temporary illusion and the ultimate reality has nothing to do with this world so the ultimate reality in because this world is a illusion and when we wake up from a dream the dream has no reality so the ultimate reality has nothing to do with this so when the ultimate reality is perceived simply as existence with no material and potencies or no spiritual potencies that conception is called as brahman parmatma is the conception of the ultimate reality where it has material potencies that means is overseeing the material world that is the parmatma conception and the ultimate reality as having both material and spiritual potencies that is bhagwan so bhagwan is that yes there is a lord who controls this world oversees this world but then the lord also has has qual uh, qualities and attributes which are completely non which are completely non material he has a form he has a personality with which which is which are all spiritual and with which he reciprocates with the ultimate with his devotees in the in the spiritual world so here when we say material potencies potency can include form it can have personal include personality it can include qualities it can include activities so brahman has no material potencies in the sense that there is no material form now bhagwan does he have a material form not exactly a material form but he has a form that can manifest even in the material world when krishna comes his form is not material but it manifests in the material world so and krishna can control and he does control material things that he is spiritual doesn't mean that he has nothing to do with the material and he can't do anything material 
that means he is not entangled or contaminated by the material but he does control material things so that is brahman paramatma and bhagwan three levels so now the concluding point here with respect to concept and nomenclature that krishna is both the highest manifestation of the absolute truth and he is also the whole absolute truth that means in this particular diagram that we discussed earlier so krishna can refer to the ultimate reality so for example when krishna uh, says to arjuna that he is krishna is standing before arjuna and krishna says to arjuna that nothing exists beyond me that nat natasti vinayatsyan maya bhutam characharam yachapi sarva bhutanam bijam tadham arjuna in 1039 he says nothing would exist without me so when he saying this what does it mean he is referring to himself as the ultimate reality maya tatam idam sarvam jagad avyakta murtina matsthani sarva bhutani nacham deshva vastata that by me all of existence is pervaded so now when krishna is saying this how, how do we make sense of it krishna is present in front of arjuna on his chariot so krishna is at one place is at one place then how is he pervading everything so there are times when the word when in krishna the word krishna is used and krishna is referring to himself so the word krishna can refer to the ultimate reality in all the manifestations brahman parmatma and bhagwan and sometimes when krishna says come to me that means don't go there when he come to me if the ultimate reality is everywhere then what is the point of krishna saying come to me sarva dharman pratyaj maam ekam sharanam come surrender to me what is the point of saying surrender to me if and come to me when he is everywhere or krishna says maam eti that you will attain me that janma karma chame divyam evam yo vetti tatvatah tyaktva deham punar janma naiti maam eti so arjuna if you understand my transcendental past times in truth then you will come to me now if krishna is everywhere what is the meaning of coming to him here when krishna is using maam eti he is referring to not krishna as the ultimate reality but krishna in the feature of bhagwan that he although god exists everywhere that doesn't mean that he does not exist at a particular place he in his brahman manifestation he pervades all of existence as is bhagwan he is present at a particular place where by and by that presence he reciprocates uh, loving relationships with the loving past times with his devotees loving interactions with his devotees so krishna refers to both the ultimate reality as well as the topmost manifestation of the ultimate reality that is the bhagwan aspect so again based on context we need to understand what in the bhagavad gita also as well as in other scriptures when when the word krishna is used or maam is used when krishna is speaking then what is it referring to so this is a technical and profound subject but essentially the concluding point would be that krishna god is both personal and impersonal he is transpersonal so i'll summarize and then we can have a few questions so today i discussed about the topic of is the ultimate reality personal or impersonal and it started by talking about first the inconceivable nature of the ultimate reality even matter when studied deeply uh, is too complex as it happens with quantum physics and what to speak of the transcendental reality which is not perceivable so it's not that sim- it's not simplistic that ultimate reality is personal or impersonal the opposite of one profound truth say god is personal or another profound truth god is impersonal so this these are both profound truths and we need to ap- approach the ultimate reality and the controversy about it with humility so then we discussed the inconceivable nature inconceivable inconceivable means beyond our intelligence by definition our if our, our intelligence alone can't conquer or comprehend the absolute in fully then it discussed about the where the impersonal conception is right and where it goes wrong so we discuss four points within that first is that forms are limit forms are limited and the ultimate truth is unlimited that's true but just formlessness doesn't make anything unlimited uh, a house can be demolished but it's uh, the debris doesn't become unlimited 
rather if we say something is formless then it deprives it, it is less so how can the so if form is very attractive in this world how can the souls of this world not have that which is most attractive in this world then we discuss that if if even if god has a form why should it be a human form is that anthropomorphism no our form is not based on god uh, our form is based on god's form not god's form is based on our form that's theomorphism and why is uh, among all forms why is our form more than god's form because our human form is the form within nature that is most that is closest to god that can uh, that has the spiritual potential to realize the divine and the divine form then doesn't form limit then we discuss there about the negative axis and the positive axis that uh, material for what limits is not mat not form but matter the spiritual form has the potential to be unlimited and we discussed about krishna was on the lap of his mother and although he was within the universe the universe was within him and then we discussed about how the impersonalists are right in the sense that there are statements in scripture which say god has no form but scriptures also say god has a form so how do we reconcile both that is by arthapatti that just like devdatta does not eat throughout the day devdatta weight is increasing the arthapatti is that hmm, <clears throat> devdatta eats secretly at night so so the arthapatti is the god has no material form but has spiritual form so arupaya ururupaya from gajendra's past time and the last part was more technical about how uh, the three levels of the absolute using the cake metaphor so the cake may be perceived only in terms of fragrance that like it's like perceiving the ultimate truth only in terms of an eternal existence so that is the brahman aspect ultimate reality perceived without any potencies pure existence just mere existence then when say the ultimate reality has potencies to control and orchestrate this world that is the paramatma conception sat and chit is perceived and then sat chit and ananda ultimate reality has oh, reciprocates love and gains joy through that that's ananda aspect that is the bhagwan aspect so within the gaudiya vaishnava analysis brahman paramatma and bhagwan have technical these are tech, these are word the names for particular conceptions of the absolute so otherwise generically brahman can also refer to the ultimate reality and as in brahman also refers to vishnu or krishna and then lastly we talk about krishna when is used in the bhagavad gita sometimes krishna refers to himself as the transpersonal absolute and sometimes krishna refers to himself as the uh, complete material reality and god ultimately is not per, just personal in the sense of having limitations like our per, we persons are and god is not impersonal in the sense of being less than person but god is transpersonal so thank you very much hare krishna okay so how do we understand the manifestation of the lord as the devtas well the devtas are manifestations not in the sense that they are non different from him but that rather his uh, to some extent some power of his is manifested in them uh, in a significant degree so it is not said that the devtas are entirely the same as the divine they are so there are various levels of manifestation so there are for ex- we will talk about this in more technical detail in a future session but there are the manifestations of krishna vishnu such as ram narasimha varaha vamana who are non different from the absolute they are all equally god they are equally the ultimate reality but then uh, there is there are the, there is the one supreme being god and then there are also other manifestations who are at a intermediate level so we humans also manifest uh, we are also sparks of god and we also manifest some potency of god but the potency that we manifest is very less 
what the gods or the devatas manifest is much more than what we do but what what krishna wish to manifest is the fullest so the devatas are manifestations in the sense that some of his potencies are manifest in him so why do why do impersonalists grankaris have so many followers well it's not exactly impersonalists who have many followers it is more that spiritual teachers who do not uh, ask their uh, followers to follow many rules and give people an appearance of spirituality the feeling that i am i am being spiritual that i am doing something uh, good religious connected with god that attracts a lot of people and if you see most people who even are impersonalists and who have mass following they all in their talks they talk about bhakti they may say that ultimately the the ultimate reality is niraka nir but if you see their talks then their talk actually to talk about the ultimate reality is impersonal is very abstract philosophical and hardly relishable because the idea is everything that we talk about is illusion so the only thing to talk about is that there is nothing to talk about and that's why what do they talk about they talk about the various uh, they, they talk about leela they say bhakti is a way to brahman to mukti so that is not a scriptural understanding that is a, that is their own concocted understanding so they use bhakti as a tools to oh, impersonal uh, more and what what attracts mass following is their bhakti those people who claim that they are own they themselves are god because everybody is brahman so i am brahman and i am realized brahman you are not yet realized brahman so you worship me as brahma and they have people chanting the names of their particular guru there are bhajans which are all about their gurus they talk about the leela of their gurus uh, whom they consider to be god so essentially it's not possible uh, to talk much about brahman and if somebody has mass following it is not because they are impersonal is that they have mass following it is because they they do talk about bhakti because bhakti only gives something relishable to discuss and they have mass following primarily because they do not uh, expect many rules to be followed and people can uh, have the sense that they are being spiritual without surrendering see when you talk about following rules how we can understand rules very much in a personal context they, if we want to love someone relationships are often difficult to sustain because relationships make demands from us that if we want to love someone then often we have to do the things that they like to do and we have to avoid the things stop, stop doing the things we don't like to do so now krishna is not like a person with whimsical or arbitrary likes and dislikes he likes the things that are good for us that uplift us that help us grow spiritually and he uh, dislikes the things that that drag us down spiritually but then committing to krishna surrendering to krishna involves some serious commitment with rules and those who talk about bhakti without any rules they are they may have some devotional emotion but their devotion itself is not really very serious or very seriously very significantly transformational so the following is and now also another point is that you know we cannot gauge the correctness of a conception by the fall number of followers it has that way if we say but always throughout history materialistic people were more than spiritual people then does that mean that materialism is right and spirituality is wrong no this world is a place of maya of illusion and it requires some level of intelligence to pursue reality there so many people watch advertisements and buy things based on advertisements now if all the ads were true then all the products would be flawless but it's not that simple so multiple levels of answers first is the popularity of impersonalists is because of their laxity in rules and they are maybe impersonalists at a private or philosophical level but publicly 
they do talk about personality and bhakti because otherwise there's nothing to talk about and so and because this world is a place of illusion even uh, incorrect or incompletely correct ideas can also gain a lot of following as happens with materialism thank you okay now in the path of devotion can one start with the brahman realization and then gradually go through parmatma to bhagwan in the path of devotion we start with the bhagwan conception itself because when if we are practicing bhakti then we hear krishna lila we have the vigraha the form of deity form of krishna where we worship krishna so that's uh, now although we are worshiping krishna we may not really appreciate krishna tatvatah in truth we may not understand krishna so it could be that somebody who is following a, even a impersonal path and they are worshiping brahman or they are pursuing brahman or realizing brahman they may actually be more realized so somebody might be worshiping krishna but they may be infatuated with temporary things and they seek the temporary from krishna somebody on the other hand might be uh, uh, seeking pursuing the brahman and they may be very realized about uh, the temporary nature of material things so uh, it's uh, so now when we are on our spiritual path do we consciously does a devotee first consciously realize the brahman aspect then the parmatma aspect then the bhagwan aspect well these aspects are not like three discrete things it is not that brahman is here parmatma is here and bhagwan is here they are all one reality and as devotees it could be that we go through a progressive realization that uh, say we are practicing bhakti and while practicing bhakti slowly we start realizing that hey there is something eternal beyond the temporary maybe we go to a maybe we go to some sacred place and there we see some magnificent temples and then we just see the height of the temples we start thinking hey, there there's something something which is beyond all this something which is eternal now of course because it is connected with krishna it's not simply a brahman realization but if we just appreciate the eternity of something beyond the temporal temporality of the various things in the world we could say that is in some ways an appreciation of the brahman realization uh, an appreciation of the brahman aspect of the absolute then the parmatma is the ultimate reality with material attributes that means what with material potencies rather not attributes potencies so then say in the course of our life when we face some difficulties and some terrible things happen and we are wondering <coughs> why is this happening to me but then we see that even through bad things something good comes out and then we understand actually there was a plan there was a purpose and then when we see that things were purposefully orchestrated and even from the bad good came and then we see the hand of god over there then that is in some ways realizing the parmatma aspect so when we see god's hand leading us through darkness to light in this world then that is the parmatma aspect and then say when we uh, we we experience a non material divine devotional joy independent of our material situation so we might be in great anxiety materially we might be very sick and in pain but then we start glorifying krishna we start hearing about krishna speaking about krishna singing about krishna and we just experience a non material joy independent of whatever our material situation is even if it is not resolved we experience a flood of love for krishna attraction for krishna within us then that could be said to an experience be an experience of bhagwan so now will these be linear no they can all be parallel also we can be relishing the personal aspect of the absolute and at the same time also gaining deeper realization of the eternality of of that that there being a eternal reality beyond so devotees will not necessarily linearly go through brahman parmatma bhagwan realizations 
devotees already have a bhagwan conception through the practice or through the study of devotional books and we get different we realize different aspects of the divine during our spiritual journey ultimately of course we realize the personal aspect of the absolute so do souls do souls in animal bodies also have a spiritual form if animals also have souls why the enjoyment they pursue pursue is limited as compared to what the enjoyments human seek it is because firstly the soul is the same but the consciousness how much it is expressed depends on the body just like if there can be a light source a bulb but if the bulb is covered by a very thick film then the light that may come out of, of light that comes out from it may be very diffused and not very bright but if the light is uh, the bulb is covered by a very thin film then the light that comes out is brighter so the soul goes to an animal body because it has a lot of material conditionings and it has a lot of material desires for material pleasures and because of that the spiritual consciousness doesn't manifest much in the human form there is a uh, because the human form because the soul has evolved through various lower species now the soul has opportunity for pursuing spirituality that's why there is a greater greater manifestation of consciousness and the greater the manifestation of consciousness then greater is the variety of ways in which you can pursue pleasure pers pers we can experience pleasure just like if we are sleeping what joy can we experience not much it's just the comfort of a bed unless of course we are dreaming which is a different thing but when we are awake and conscious then we can experience many more joys so if somebody is singing a lullaby to put a baby put a child put a person baby to sleep now you okay they might be comforting and putting a baby to sleep but the beauty and the melody of the lullaby if it's to be relished person has to be awake so wakefulness and sleep and sleep are different levels of consciousness so when the when there is greater consciousness then there is a greater capacity to experience life and also enjoy so now the soul is always what it is so the soul doesn't change its consciousness changes the soul does it so form is latent within the soul always and the soul's spiritual form manifests when the soul goes back to the spiritual world but right now whether it is a human body or an animal body the soul is in a soul is in this presence of is in the is we could say in the form of a spark it's a keshaga sita bhagasya sita kalpita sya and indicative description is given that the soul is 110 uh, 110000 the tip of a hair that is the um, so that is how the soul is in all bodies human or non human just the uh, manifestation of the consciousness is different in different bodies then can you explain pantheism panentheism henotheism yeah so pan means all pantheism is the idea that everything is god so this is the idea that there is no specific god with a particular form or there is no divinity beyond nature the universe itself is is divine so now pantheism is not is is different from what we call as impersonalism because impersonalism does have the idea that god is non material so god is the ultimate reality is distributed across all of existence but the ultimate reality is spiritual pantheism may not have that idea pantheism is basically like nature is god or everything is god so the pantheism could be even materialistic it doesn't have to be but just so there could be for example there are atheistic scientists who say for me the universe is god the law of gravity is everywhere and therefore law of gravity is like god for me well that is not exactly the way god is conceived in the uh, in the religious tradition or the spiritual traditions of the world so pantheism is and everything is god now what is everything if somebody is a materialist then there is nothing beyond matter then matter is everything then pantheism for them would mean that matter itself is god but if somebody is spiritualist then then it could be that like krishna says vasudeva sarvamiti that is not a pantheistic statement but 
there is that idea that for those who are impersonalist, they may consider the God is the all pervading reality. So even impersonalists can be pantheists, but not always. Now panentheism is that God is everything, but God is also his own thing. That means everything manifests God, uh, but God also has his own personal manifestation. So God is nature and God is more. That is the idea of panentheism. And henotheism is the idea that this is a this was a more or less a Western interpretation of the uh, of the Indian tradition. So when the Europeans came to India, those colonists they tried to understand uh, the, what was going on in India. They saw on one side so many multiplicity of gods being worshipped. On the other side, they saw that there are these Upanishadic books which talk about an an impersonal reality. So they had the idea that that there is the ultimate reality is impersonal, and that ultimate reality can be conceived of in whichever form we want. And so that an impersonal reality is worshipable or accessible and worshipable through various forms that is called as henotheism. So in this henotheism, the idea is that the form is considered as a transitional tool to attain the formless absolute. In fact, most uh, regarding the earlier question, most impersonalist paths that are popular, they they are not openly impersonalist or monist, uh, monistic. Monism is there is only one substance, one ultimate reality. So they are often henotheistic. So they have their idea of worshiping God, and because they are quite um, they seem to be quite liberal. You don't have to worship one particular form. You worship any form. And you can worship, the guru might say that I'm also Brahman, so you can worship my form also. So henotheism is the idea that we can, we can worship God, we can worship the ultimate through any form that we want because ultimately the, form, uh, the ultimate is formless and the form is just a conceptual, just a transitional conceptual tool. Now, sometimes personalists may also become Brahman worshippers. Why is that? Well, that if that happens, that's not because the Brahman conception is higher than the or more relishable than the uh, Bhagwan conception. Rather, it is because of sometimes those who are worshipping Bhagwan they might be judgmental, they might be condescending, they might be holier than thou. So you know, uh, atheism, for example, is not like a very attractive or fulfilling doctrine. The main reason for atheism is not because atheism is attractive, but because theists are often unattractive, even repulsive. People, extreme, people who encounter sentimentality or fanaticism among theistic followers, they become atheistic. So similarly, somebody who, who experiences narrow-mindedness, bigotry, or sectarianism, extremism, among the, those who are following the bhakti path or, for, or worshiping a personal aspect, uh, then if people encounter such people, then that will repel them. So that's how sometimes people who are following a personal path might go towards impersonalism, not because the personal conception is less attractive and impersonal more attractive, but because sometimes the personal worshippers, because they are they are neophyte, they are new, they are immature, they might repel people. Yes, and the, this relates to the next question about sometimes although we are personalists, our behavior is impersonal. Yes, that, that happens because there is this tendency to become self-righteous. So if I think that I know what is right and this is wrong. So sometimes we, as, as those who are devoted to God, 
we are meant to manifest the love and compassion of god first not his not his wrath or his judgment now yes there is god gives wisdom and based on the wisdom judgment is to be made but devotion is is primarily about love and compassion not about um, uh, judgment and condemnation so sometimes what happens while practicing bhakti because bhakti involves surrender surrender involves following certain rules and regulations which are important for the serious practice of bhakti and uh, and developing a personal relationship with krishna but because we do this we might become quite self righteous and proud i am following this i have the correct understanding and i have the correct practices and you have an incorrect understanding you have an incorrect practice so there are two aspects to and on any spiritual path there is what is called a doxy and praxis doxy is with respect to doctrine or beliefs or right or philosophical understanding and a praxis refers to practices so when we tra- we practice bhakti we become quite uh, judgmental about that my understanding is right and my practices are right your understanding is wrong your practices are wrong so our spirituality is meant to make us more empathic everybody is so like us everybody has conditions like us their conditions may be different from our conditions but everybody is struggling and we all need to help each other but sometimes our spirituality instead of forming a bridge between us and others say, the other person is here i am here instead of forming a bridge between us it forms a bl- barricade between us a block a blockage between us why i am high we place ourselves on top of the barricade that i am pure you are impure i am right you are wrong so impersonal tendency comes largely because of judgmentality also it may come because within the path of bhakti we may have a superficial understanding of bhakti bhakti is not just about what we do but also about how we do so we may want to do lots of services for krishna and in wanting to do a lot of things for krishna we may neglect people we neglect the devotees of krishna we may trample over them we may use and then discard them and you did the service now i don't care for you so when we think of success in bhakti only in terms of of targets and goals and achievements and projects then what happens is uh, we are doing it for krishna but actually what krishna wants the most is not projects what krishna wants is people krishna wants us and krishna wants other devotees all the projects are meant for krishna doesn't want temples in this world krishna wants uh, the souls in this world to come to him even the most magnificent temple in the world eventually it is going to because of the nature of material things in the world being temporary and that temple is going to be be affected by the ravages of time so anyways that was the answer to that question that Uh, sometimes because of being too project oriented we might uh, neglect devotees and that's how we become impersonal so how is negation of the abs- how can negation of the absolute truth also be absolute well i didn't say that exactly that negation of the absolute truth is absolute what it means is in the context what i meant was that there is there is a personal aspect and the impersonal aspect and both of them are true it is not that mm, every negation is itself an absolute truth now that if we say krishna is krishna is all attractive and somebody says that krishna is unattractive that is not the absolute that is not that is not the correct understanding it is not that for every positive attribute it's opposite is also apply is also absolute and also apply, applies to krishna no krishna is inclusive of everything but at the same time he manifests some things no so krishna is krishna is beautiful now does the now does now if krishna includes everything does that mean krishna is the opposite of beauty is ugliness so the negation of beauty will be ugliness so is krishna ugly well not exactly the krishna can also manifest a form which is ferocious like narsimha dev that's not exactly agri really it's scary but for a devotee it's not scary for those who are demoniac it's scary 
so it's not that the negation of the absolute truth is also absolute it's just that uh, the personal conception and the uh, impersonal conception it's not that one is right and the other is wrong both are right because the absolute truth is neither personal or impersonal is transpersonal <clears throat> so normally by negation of worldly things one can get to a transcendence uh, move to it so there's form the form captivates us no for this form is not real then what is real so negation in the domain of matter can take us to a transcendence and in some analytical ways we could say that the absolute truth is so inclusive that even the opposite attributes are included in it but that doesn't mean that every negation of the absolute truth is itself an absolute truth does krishna stabilize the faith of sadhakas who are worshiping self proclaimed who, who are worshiping god men who claim that they are god krishna works in mysterious ways and one aspect of worshiping him is to understand that he is he is inconceivable so when we make choices it's not that every choice that we make is what krishna wants us to make that choice mm. but so we might make wrong choices we might make mistakes and those mistakes are because of our own desires so now krishna is so expert that he can use our mistakes for help he can even use our mistakes to take us forward so with respect to say somebody uh, somebody starts to worship starts coming in contact with a person who is worshiping uh, who claims to be god so now it could be that that person is is just a spiritual seeker but maybe because of their family their culture their context that was the path they encountered the first time mm -hmm. so now in this case what will happen they may explore it and krishna will guide them so now how deep should they would they explore it it depends they may explore that path that path but krishna is there with them and what is necessary for their spiritual evolution krishna will do sometimes somebody has to go deep into a particular path to get jolted out of it hey this doesn't make sense at all for some people they just explore a little bit and they understand hey, this doesn't make sense so each person is different and each person is on their own level in their spiritual evolution and whatever is appropriate for them krishna does that so sometimes a person has to uh, they quickly understand something is wrong sometimes they have to go a long way off to understand that is something is wrong but either way krishna is always with them and krishna is guiding them so so in that sense krishna is like ultimate G, the ultimate gps so gps we are, we are going on a particular road and the gps says turn right then if we turn left gps doesn't abandon us gps will keep still telling gps will okay now reroute and go from here but if you keep going left then still gps will keep rerouting of course it will take us a long time for us to reach the destination but gps will keep rerouting so krishna is like that krishna uh, Krish, krishna does not plan our mistakes but krishna's plan includes our mistakes krishna doesn't want us to make those mistakes so it is not that krishna is giving us faith in something which is not good for us but sometimes that's what is required for us to grow so from our perspective uh, if we know someone who is worshiping some 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 godman who claims to be god or is some worshiping some teacher who is as if they are god that teacher is god then we need to see what is the best role that we can play in a mood of service to krishna is it that we can at that stage uh, with with patience with gentleness with uh, with logic challenge their conceptions 
and help them evolve to a higher conception or sometimes it might be that at this stage they're not open to hearing anything else then maybe so we ex uh, then maybe we just maintain a good rapport with them try to have a good, good working relationship with them and eventually when the right time comes we can play a role in helping them come to a, a better understanding so generally just like when we enter into a lake first we put our maybe toe in to see how cold it is so like that we need to we need to explore we need to test the pulse to understand how best we can play our part so krishna is playing his part not so and krishna's part may be that he may sometimes give them the necessary conviction to go along that path or he may give the give me them the understanding by which they can change course and by testing the pulse we can move forward and gain a better understanding of how best we can play a part in krishna's plan so thank you very much uh, hare krishna